Hi guys, as you know, we're here at Selwig and I am here with the terribly tall, handsome and infamous uh, Mr. 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 Lardy number one. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, nice uh, to be on the show. Hi there. So um, we've got some, we're a bit out of the way in the hope that you can still hear us among the noise of Selwig. We've got some B-roll footage of that beautiful chain of command board. So why don't you tell me a bit about what's going on there? Yeah, well, we, we got invited to go over to uh, the Hartenstein Hotel Airborne Museum in Arnhem. Uh, nice. to run chain of command and uh, we wanted to represent three areas from the perimeter the table you saw today is one of those areas we did three tables the first was the iconic location of the main dressing station crossroads which is on a lot of historical oil paintings of the area right and uh, that was uh, an urban table the one you've seen today is the suburban table which is about 150 yards north of the the uh, uh, British Airborne Headquarters at the Hartenstein, mm -hmm. and then we did a more rural table off to the west. So we really had those three areas, which are only you know a few hundred yards apart in reality, give three very different types of terrain that's being fought yeah. over. So we wanted to really represent that and put that together to give people an opportunity, visitors to the museum, to, have, to see uh, what the Arnhem would have looked like, or what Oosterbeek, the perimeter there, would have looked like at mm. the time of the battle. And also to bring that to life, because I think a lot of people go along to museums and see a lot of things in glass cases. And it, it, it you know, it might, might be interesting, but it doesn't really tell us the story of what went on. Whereas a war game can really do that. Can really bring the things it, are moving, right? Can, and things are happening. In a way, it's yeah. kind of a semi... Um, uh, we love a semi on the channel. It's it, a bit of a semi, yeah, that's right. It's a semi-word that I can't remember, but an animation of what's happening. Yeah, yeah, great. And, and, and no, animation, not reenactment, yeah. animation. So <laughs> one of, the, um, one of the, the things, just looking at that board, Yeah, it's beautiful. It's lovely to play on a board with that level of detail. Mm. I mean, we've often, as war gamers, like terrain is often the weakest part of our collection, right? We've got rules. Yeah. We've got more rules than we're ever going to play. Mm. We've got more figures than we're ever going to paint. But when we come to actually play the game, we may be using bits of scenery from all over the place. So to yeah. come to a show like this, in the gardens, rail fencing with hedging behind, that's yeah. like a load of work has gone into that. Mm. And it's, re it's really immersive to play. I think, in, that's, in that. I think that's the key word, isn't it? Immersive, because what we're doing when we're playing a war game is we're attempting to suspend our belief. Uh, mm. You know, we want to introduce an element of... Uh, amazement and draw people into the story and the more attractive our table is the easier it is to suspend that disbelief and the more uh, the more appealing it is to us to play that game yeah. you know uh, when you when you go to a museum and see those huge dioramas of the battle of waterloo or whatever mm. you, you look at that and you study the detail and it's the attention to detail that brings it to life yeah. it was just a load of toy soldiers lined up wouldn't be very impressive but the fact you've got that rolling countryside and that in on the hill and whatever mm. it's it's that, that that really captivates the audience and we wanted to do exactly that because we knew that unlike here today where we're presenting this to war gamers when we're there at uh, Oosterbeek at the museum we're presenting this to members of the public who probably have no idea what war gaming is maybe mm. it's their first point of contact with it mm. and what we want to do is to create a level of interest so they don't have to be interested in wargaming to come and look at the table and go, wow, I recognise that building over there. I so, mean, my auntie lives there. Yeah, exactly. And we actually had people come up and tell there us those go, stories. Right. And, you know, one woman came up and said, yeah, I lived at that house and the house you've got there with a the green door, that guy, believe it or not, was a bicycle repairman <laughs> who was a member of the resistance. And because right. he had to go and mend bicycles, he had a permit that allowed him to cycle off here, there and everywhere. Oh, so right. he could take messages right. or burns or whatever, wherever, wherever he mm. went. So it was really interesting uh, interacting with the members of the public. And in order to achieve that, we couldn't just use generic wargaming buildings. No. We had to try and faithfully recreate the feel of the area. Again, yeah. if you're looking at a suburban area, you're not going to recreate a run of 12 houses. It might be eight war games houses, but it can still have that, that feel, feel for the mm. area. And that's very much what we're trying to do. And, and hopefully that means that now that we've got that game that's designed for non war gamers, when we bring it to a war game show, it becomes all the, all the more impressive because we've gone that extra mile and mm. hopefully got that degree of detail. And I think in, a, in an urban warfare game, it becomes all the more important because it, it represents 
the reality of the terrain that's there. It's not just a load of boxes, which are houses where you can run around and yeah. that you've actually got real terrain. And mm. you read a lot of British accounts of uh, the campaign in Arnhem and they talk a lot about these wire fences that gave, gave them no cover but were difficult to cross. Yep. So they were, they were the worst type of obstacle. Yeah, and, yeah. and we've been able to recreate them. Of course, what we couldn't do was buy any of this stuff off the peg this is the majority of war games buildings, let's be honest, are based on Normandy. Mm. So what we did was we commissioned a 3D printer and got him to recreate the Dutch buildings. We'd been out to uh, uh, the area before, taking photographs. Uh, uh, my colleague Nick went back twice earlier on this year to take more pictures. Uh, and so we could really ensure that the buildings were there and looked absolutely like a Dutch suburban area rather than just a generic built up area. So, yeah. And he had a few holidays as a tax writer. <laughs> Good Lord, what an idea. Whoa. Um, we probably should have said this earlier, for anyone that doesn't know, and we should never assume anything, yeah. what's happening at Oosterbeck? Well, what is happening at Oosterbeck is that you've got, uh, when the British land, they, they land by... Uh, this is Arnhem. This is Arnhem, by parachute or by glider. They're, they're about eight miles away from their objective, which is mm -hmm. the bridge at Arnhem. What happens is some of them get through. If you've seen the film A Bridge Too Far, you'll know that John Frost and his battalion, the majority of his battalion, achieved that, got hold of the north end of the bridge and held out there for several days. A lot of uh, Germans then moved rapidly in, into position, which uh, mm -hmm. Germans are very good at responding with their camp group because of the, their style of leadership is mm -hmm. just, just do it. Don't and wait to be told. And they formed a blocking position. So the troops who'd meant to be going through to reinforce the bridge actually got funneled away and uh, were trapped up against the Rhine, but they formed this big perimeter, which is like one of those big balloons you get at a party. Yeah, they... It's tall with a big bulbous end. Oh. Yeah. So that's the Oosterbeck pocket, and it's the mm. bulk of the yeah. of the airborne yeah. forces. Yeah. So that's chain of command. You, yeah. But you have, you know, the number mm. of games that you have mm. produced now is, mm. is quite considerable. Mm. I, I, um, so before we played what I played my first game of What a Thanker yesterday. Mm. Really, it's a fun little experience, yeah. you know. Um, uh, you mentioned chain of command, but for those uh, people who follow Lardy perhaps a bit more mm. closely, what have we got in the works? What's in the pipeline? Well, we're working uh, very much on seven pint-sized campaign. Seven? Oh, seven. Yeah, that's it. That's, <laughs> that's the invisible second hand coming into play here. Um, that's a game designer's trick. Um, mm. uh, we, uh, we've got seven pint-sized campaigns covering the market garden um, operation. So we've got the, the troops of 30 Corps, the tanks, the Irish Guards, Michael Kane. Michael Kane, yeah, Edward film. Fox. Yeah, you're only meant to blow the bloody doors off. That's right. a They're film, driving. Oh, was it a different film? Yeah. Right, OK. They're driving up from the Belgian border and they're heading up to try and relieve the British paras who are up there. So we've got four campaigns covering 30 Corps and the uh, US Airborne Forces who are creating the pockets through which the, the armoured troops can advance. So we've got four campaigns there, and we've got three campaigns around Arnhem with British Airborne Forces there. Mm -hmm. That's something we were working on. Going over to Arnhem gave us an opportunity to spend several more days up in that area, visiting a few more of the battlefield sites that we'd been to, but just wanted to check up on some final details, rewalk that ground. And so we've got seven pint-sized campaigns and the Arnhem Handbook coming up. We're working, still working on the Far East campaign uh, handbook, which is going to be covering... British forces, American forces, Dutch forces, Japanese forces, obviously, Indian Army as well, and all sorts of different colonial forces, and of course, United States forces, United States Marines, Army, Australians. So the whole bag of the Pacific Theatre and the Far East. That's all in one book. All in one book. That's coming to fruition. Huge amount of army lists in there, mm -hmm. and special rules for jungle warfare fighting, which is important. We're just going into the final playtest stage of What a Cowboy. You mentioned What a Tanker. We're yeah. actually taking some of the mechanisms from What a Tanker and using that for cowboys, who are nice. great because they don't have tanks, but they do have nice hats. They do. And, and yeah. uh, do you get, like, you know, um, a six-up deflection for the sheriff star? You do, yes. That is part it's of big it. enough. No. No, oh, boo! <laughs> and, but, has that has that got that fun and a little bit of a, a nod and a wink yeah, aspect to it? Very much so. Yeah. I mean, what I'm thinking, you, you look at the title and you're mm. thinking, 
this isn't a game to take terribly seriously, but enjoy. No, that's right. We we flew out to uh, Northern Ireland to run the game by the guys on the Beast of War channel, and a right. cu couple of air hostesses had to do a double take mm -hmm. and asked us about why why we had a certain phrase on our, our shirt. And we had to point <laughs> out it wasn't quite what they thought they were seeing, mm. but uh, uh, and then we all laughed at that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, but what a cowboy. Yeah, we got what a Fokker in the works, which is a uh, First World War aerial stuff, but that's a little bit further away. But now, yeah, we're going But into... I've got to get painting my red planes. Yeah, you can paint your red What red scale planes. is it intended to be playing uh, well, in for those that want to get ready? any scale you want, but we're using a lot of the old Wings of War, the old wings uh, of War planes, stuff. which are rather nice because you just get them out of the box. And loads of them are available on eBay. Great time yeah. to buy. Yeah, oh, interesting. So, and they're all painted for you. And you, you can you can add a little bit, you know, a little bit Give of a bit of weathering or yeah, something. Um, so, come on in, spill the beans. Mm. What what a fucker! There's uh, getting air combat yeah. to to be an an, an interesting mm. game, yeah. but a reasonable stab at a simulation of what's going on here. Mm. It's really hard to do. Yeah, very. Really difficult to yeah. do. So, you know, I, how are you dealing with, you know, beware of the hon in the sun. That's got to be in there somewhere, yeah, yeah, is it? Yeah, definitely. That's yeah. that's a special yeah. rule. Yeah. But, how are you? So, are you dealing with altitude in abstractly yep. or directly? Or uh, well, uh, fairly directly. Although you know, it is abstract in as much as your model doesn't actually go up and down. <laughs> yep. uh, but uh, yeah, there's 12, 12 levels of altitude. The great thing about that is you just lose, use two d six. Yeah, uh, yeah. The reason you got yeah. twelve is that it's mm. uh, it's quite easy to climb up to level six, mm. but above that, planes struggle. Uh, mm. because they're not supercharged at that stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got two dice. The first dice worth of climbing is easy. The second dice worth of climbing, climbing is harder. Mm -hmm. But we're looking very much at using a, a sort of interesting and unique mechanisms to represent some of the aerial tactics they could, they could use, such as you know, a barrel roll or looping the loop or performing an Immelman turn. The Immelman turn is all in there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah we, we, we've got that, and that's very mm -hmm. much something that... Uh, we're uh, we're looking at getting developed for hopefully next year because that's something we've right. been we were looking at uh, before we went into lockdown, but of course that that changed a lot yeah. of things. So that yeah. brought an end to the playtesting on that. But and once we got what a cowboy out, then we'll be moving on to that. that yeah. yeah. So what a cowboy Christmas? Mm. Uh, uh, probably New Year now. Probably New Year now. Mm. And what a cowboy. Ten mm. figures, sixty figures. No, more like a couple of figures per player. So oh, really? You know, if you've got if you've got six of you playing, probably going to have. Three people oh, on side, be... so yeah, very yeah. much like what a tanker is. Yeah, much more enjoyable when you're not doing it on your own. Right. <laughs> well, I've heard Top that. tip of the day. Right. Top tip of the day. Yeah. And, and then longer term stuff. I yeah. remember watching, like when we went into lockdown, you started doing fairly regular yeah, kind of po yeah. podcast type, yeah. like this is what yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. You you talked you were talking a bit about my great love and that mm. infamy, mm. but looking at pre imperial looking at carthage yeah. republicans yeah very much so i wasn't i wasn't sure where where we were with all yeah, of that. that's out there that's out there being play tested uh what we're doing is i'm basically i'm like the guy at the circus who's got all those plates spinning yeah, yeah and the yeah. problem is you can spend all your time keeping the plates spinning and, and nothing actually gets mm -hmm. done so what i've done is i've shifted my focus to getting the far east campaign finished i've got nick focusing on getting the uh arnhem uh, pint-sized campaigns finished and then once they're delivered and and uh, done then I can shift my time to going on to um, Infamy, Infamy Part 2. So we're going to be looking the war at with Carthage. Hannibal. We're going to be looking at the war with Hannibal. We're going to be looking at Greek city-states around the Mediterranean. Men oiling each other up for battle. Absolutely right. Nice. Combing their lovely locks. Even the Vikings like that, though. Well, you know, why not? Hey, you know, it's yeah. a 21st century. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was uh, Richard from Lardy Games. It's been great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Cheers.